This school is so boring. All they do is talk nonsense and do nonsense things. Worse still, I feel like I can never escape them, as some of them live in the same neighborhood as me. But you know what the most annoying thing about my life is? That's Joy, my identical twin sister. In my parents' eyes, she's perfect. That's why she's the favorite child. Her allowance is more than mine and she gets to attend an elite private school while I'm stuck at the most boring school ever. How unfair! With a sulky face, I walked into my room whining. I think having identical daughters means our parents forgot that there's actually two of us. They've never picked me up from school. Don't be absurd. They just took me to collect my dress for the school gala. <laughs> a new dress for some fancy party. How terrible for you. I don't even want to go to the party. Trust a nerd like you not to appreciate what you have. If I were you, I'd make the most of every second of that elite school of yours. And if I were you, I would just enjoy my pressure-free life. We both sighed and stared into a void thinking about our tiring lives. Then Joy suddenly turned to me. Oh my god, Jade! Do you want to be me? Go to my school, have my things, and attend the gala? What a brilliant idea! Why had we never thought of it before? I'd live her fancy life and she'd live my doll one. That's perfect! Wow, this school is enormous. I tried to keep my cool as I navigated the endless hallways in search of Joy's locker. Ah, found it. I spotted a group of girls waving me over. They must be Joy's besties. Ruth, Nora, and Nell. Unlike my boring sister, they looked very glam in their branded clothes. What a power group. Wherever we went, all eyes were on us. Students handed us snacks, saved places in the cafeteria line for us, and let us sit in the front row of the basketball match. These girls were so interesting. Bet I fit in with them way more than Joy did. Talking about Joy, she somehow loved my boring old-fashioned school. I'd never heard her chat that much in my life. About how nice my friends were, how easy all the lessons were, and how cool the school bus was. Joy's friends were so much fun, and they did cool things. For instance, they always had shopping dates and bought each other expensive gifts without question. One time, Nora, the richest girl in the group, didn't hesitate in going into Kate Spade and buying the new release handbag for Ruth. I thought this was pretty awesome of Nora, but then something happened that made me question the group dynamics. Ruth told me that she liked the red velvet cupcakes at the bakery near my house, and she asked me to buy her some. I was happy to do it, but the next day, when I brought the cupcakes and told her the price, she burst out laughing. <laughs> Joy, my dear, I don't care how much they cost. That's your concern. Then she turned to Nora, showed her a picture of a cute but expensive skirt, and told her to order it for her. Hang on, had she always been thinking it was acceptable to order us around like this? I don't understand why an innocent bookworm like my sister would hang around with this cunning clique. They don't study at all. During the test, while I was still randomly circling the answer, Ruth kept on kicking my chair and urging me to let her copy my work. And as soon as the teacher turned her back on us, she even snatched my answer sheet. Huh? What's with that attitude? I took a look around and saw both Nora and Nell were also copying another girl's paper against her will. Rude! After the test, Ruth came up to me, hissing. Have you forgotten our deal? Huh? Deal? What could it be? Well, I guess I would have to put up with Ruth for as long as I was Joy, so I could return everything to her in roughly the same condition after the gala. What I really should do now is just to enjoy this elite school life, right? So, I didn't join Ruth and her minions for lunch, but bought food from this super cool vending machine instead. They even had pizza! But, the machine made these weird sounds. Ugh, I think my food was stuck. So I kicked and tapped it. But it still didn't work! <laughs> you dare get into an altercation with the pizza machine? You must be starving. Oh. My. God. This basketball boy was the most handsome guy I'd ever seen in my life. I was too lost in his eyes to realize the dumb machine had finally delivered my lunch. This gorgeous guy then leaned towards me and my heart skipped. Oh, Cupid, I wish I was the one he picked up instead of the pizza. Here you go. Right before I could react, someone snatched the tray and pushed me aside to enter between us. Thanks, Hayden. Wanna share lunch with me? Huh, excuse me? 
How could she steal both pizza and a boy from me? The boy took my pizza from her and said, Thanks, but I'd like to share this with this cute starving girl instead. I'll buy the drinks. Wait, was he asking me? Then yes, 100% yes! Leaving a furious Ruth behind us, we walked to the bench table nearby. So, he's Hayden, the captain of the basketball team. We talked so much about our favorite comic books and even played basketball for a bit before classes. That was my best lunch ever. After school, I was about to leave when Ruth stopped me. Didn't anyone ever tell you not to mingle with Hayden? He's not wealthy. We have high standards about who deserves to be around us. Duh! Huh? She sure seemed to swoon over him earlier, but now that he'd turned her down, she decided he wasn't worthy? This girl's mindset really didn't sit well with me. As soon as I arrived home, I told Joy everything. You should listen to Ruth. Hayden must be bad news. I don't care what Ruth thinks. How come you do? Is it because of this deal you have with her? <sighs> Not your business, but stay away from Hayden. I don't want to get in trouble. Ugh, this vague hints were agitating me. What was it about? But whatever the deal between Joy and Ruth was, I wasn't going to let it get in the way of my blossoming romance with Hayden. Today, me and Hayden had arranged to meet at lunch again to play basketball. I excitedly walked out of art class just as the girl fell and dropped her painting set around my feet. I immediately picked them up for her, when all of a sudden, a boy's hand covered mine right before someone stamped their feet on our hands. It was Ruth! It was her who tripped up the poor girl too. She did all that on purpose to hurt me, but Hayden got there just in time to save the day. What do you think you're doing? Feeling too embarrassed being caught red-handed, Ruth couldn't do anything but give me a spiteful look before leaving. I couldn't believe that Hayden did that for me. His hand was swollen, but he just kept checking if my hand was okay. How can Ruth be so horrible? Because she knows everyone's ugly secrets, and she uses them to control people. Joy, she knows your secret too, right? No. Uh, um, I'm not sure, but I don't care. No matter what that secret is, she's gone too far. Don't worry, I got your back. So will I. Oh, I'm Katie, by the way. From then on, I no longer hung out with Ruth and her minions, but I kept quiet about this to Joy as I didn't want her freaking out and making us switch back places early. The more time I spent with Hayden, the more I found myself liking him. I wanted to confess to him who I really am, but I can't. At least not yet anyway. <sighs> Katie is really nice to me too, and she introduced me to her super sweet friends. Everything was just perfect, except my grades. Well, I didn't dare to tell Joy about this either. My study was pretty bad, and it literally ruined Joy's straight-A record. Meanwhile, Ruth, time after time, insisted that I was the one who had to do all her homework, research, and tests. But, duh, I couldn't even finish mine. You know what I've got. Yeah? What exactly is that you have? What's all the threat about? Ruth was stunned seeing me talking back at her like that. Yep, that was it. I've had enough. After class, she waited at my locker and signaled me to follow her to the equipment room. Finally, I could know what my secret was. Ruth showed me a video on her phone of Joy sneakily checking her notes during an examination. Was she... cheating? If our principal sees this, I'm sure your precious scholarship will be long gone. And what about that excellent student title of yours? So Ruth was using this to manipulate Joy. Does she do the same to everyone else? Do you think this would scare me? I don't think. I know. You don't want to lose everything, right? <laughs> no, Ruth. It's you who's gonna lose. Do whatever you want with that clip. Like, I care. And so, I walked away, leaving a fuming Ruth behind. To be honest, I was a bit scared. Well, I know scores and things like academic transcripts were so important to Joy. What if I destroyed it all? After my last class of the day, the thing that I feared the most came upon me. The principal called me to her office and showed me the video that proved that I cheated on a math exam. She was so disappointed in my horrible grades recently, she even asked if it was because I was too caught up in my dating life and the bad influence I called friends. But how am I supposed to tell her that it was just my own incompetence? Nothing to do with Joy or Hayden or my new friends. I just reached my room door when I heard mom scolding Joy. The principal must have called her. It was all my fault. 
When mom left the room, I could feel how angry and frustrated mom was. Joy, I'm so sorry. I couldn't let Ruth have this hold over me. Um, I mean you anymore. I waited for Joy to take it out on me, but to my surprise, she was kinda happy. That's okay. I think I should thank you for that. I've never been brave enough to stand up for myself, although I was so tired of getting picked on all the time. I was so scared, but turns out being scolded by mom isn't as bad as I thought. <laughs> my homeroom teacher also called me, but she only gave me a warning and told me not to make the same mistake again. I've never felt this at ease before, Jade. I'm not the perfect Joy anymore. Then, Joy told me about the pressure she felt to be perfect. One time, she even got sick before the math test due to studying too much. Not having enough decent revision and being afraid of getting a bad grade, Joy cheated and was caught and recorded by Ruth as evidence. We finally understood each other and decided to teach Ruth a lesson to stop manipulating and taking advantage of others. We spied on Ruth and secretly recorded her. And guess what? Turned out she was not as wealthy as she always pretended to be. All the brand names she had were from the poor victims that she called friends. I also filmed Ruth forcing the top students to do homework and essays for the rich kids while she just sat idly to collect money. I was so ready to post these videos online, but Joy stopped me. She told me if we did this, we were just as bad as Ruth. Instead, she had a better idea. She sent the videos to Ruth and demanded her to delete all of the student's secrets. In exchange, we would delete all of hers. Ruth, of course, had no choice but to obey. Wow, how mature my sister is. My last day in Joy's life has arrived. I'm just gonna make the most of it before I hand the reins back to my sister. Honestly, I kinda miss my normal school and my friends. But what about Hayden? Will he still want to know me when he finds out I lied to him? I was looking around for Hayden when I saw some mean girls mocking Ruth for wearing a dress cheaper than theirs. So I walked straight up to them and whispered into their ears that I knew all their dirty secrets and they couldn't do anything else but storm off. Ruth gave me a coy look, mumbled a thank you, and then left. At that moment, a warm hand gently clasped mine. Hayden! Wow, you're so cool. I... I'm not that cool, Hayden. Actually, I am... I have something I have to tell you. I then told him everything. From how I swapped identities with my twin sister, to how I ruined her school life because of my childishness. You didn't ruin anything. Actually, you made things much better. So, since the pizza vending machine day till now, it has always been you. Not Joy, right? Yeah, it's been me all along. <laughs> That's all I needed to know. Then he pulled me in for the best kiss ever. Ugh! Look at them flirting! What an eyesore! But don't get it wrong, trust me, this is no happy family. That woman there isn't my mom. She's Rochelle, our housemaid. I repeat, housemaid! But it looks like she has her sights set on becoming my stepmom. Ugh! We only hired her because after my mom passed away, Dad and I struggled to deal with our grief, and our clumsiness as well, so tidying the house didn't take priority. I suppose Rochelle was an okay maid. Can't deny that she's a good cleaner. And her cooking is tasty. However, recently, I've noticed that she always cooks Dad's favorite meals. Also, they laugh and flirt and constantly give each other these gooey-eyed looks. Yuck! Today, she even took out her handkerchief and attentively wiped my Dad's sweaty forehead. Who does she think she is? She definitely wanted to hypnotize Dad. If she thought she'd have a slot in this house, she was totally wrong. I needed to do something about this. I had to talk to Dad right away. Dad, Mom didn't pass away that long ago, but it looks like you've already lined up her replacement. Didn't you hurt Mom enough by reconnecting with your ex right before she died? What do you mean replacement? Brittany, you're being childish and unreasonable. I don't know, and I don't care. But I want Rochelle to get out of our house immediately. She's for sure trying to get something out of you. Okay, fine. If you insist. But make sure you find a new housemaid to replace her. Ugh. So it turns out that finding a new maid who's actually good is nearly impossible. Dozens of people came to try out, 
but none of them were as considerate as Rochelle. Okay, after all, we still needed a maid, so I reluctantly let Rochelle stay until I found someone new. This didn't mean I was going to let my annoyance for her slide. I decided that while I was stuck in the same house as her, I may as well play some tricks on her to let out my anger. When she decided to cook, again, the divine chicken soup that my dad loved so much, I kindly added a little salt to make it more savory. But somehow, my dad still praised her delicious food. He must just be flattering her, right? So I tried it for myself. What? How could she do that? It tasted amazing. Ugh. Another time, I copied this trick I saw on TikTok by sticking layers of food wrap on Rochelle's door, then acting like there was an emergency. Quick, the oven is making weird noises. I think something's burning. Rochelle quickly ran out of the room and I couldn't help but laugh my head off. Her face was really funny. She then gave me this bewildered look and smiled helplessly. Ugh, why did this woman never get mad? Okay then, let's step it up a notch. I decided to play the ultimate trick. Knowing that Rochelle was scared to death of cockroaches, I cut a cockroach shape out of paper and put it behind the fabric of her nightlight. That night, I was dozing off when I heard a screechy scream, ah, coming from Rochelle's room. Aha, success. But she was so terrified that she fainted. Oops, do you know what the most annoying thing is? Even after all the trouble I've caused her, Rochelle was still super sweet to me. She was always offering me cookies and asking me about my day and stuff. I felt like she was trying to play the role of a mother, and I didn't like that at all. She couldn't fool me. I knew she only put up with me to please my dad. Thanks to Rochelle, I could never be at ease, even in my own home. But recently, a very special person has come into my life and lit up my mood. It was totally by chance. That day, it had rained like crazy, so there were puddles everywhere. I was on my way home from the grocery store when a car drove whizzing by. I thought I was going to get a free bath, but then suddenly, an arm pulled me back and shielded me with his body, just like in a romantic movie. Standing there was a boy, soaking wet, asking if I was okay. Aww, he had totally swept me off my feet. We walked together for a while, and he told me his name's Chris, and he lives in the next neighborhood. That's it! I needed to find a way to impress Chris and also thank him for helping me. So, after some careful thinking, I decided to bake him a cake. I'd seen Rochelle bake before. It looked easy peasy. So, I baked one and gave some to my best friend Sue to try. But she spat it out and said, Ew, gross! Hmm... I sadly sat in the kitchen, staring at my pathetic cake, and wondered where I'd done wrong. That's when Rochelle stepped into the room. But to my surprise, instead of laughing at me, she patted me on the shoulder. Come here, I'll teach you how to cook. Rochelle was a good cook, so I'd be stupid not to learn from her. This doesn't mean I like her, though. I just want to win my crush's heart. So after that, each day after school... Rochelle gave me a cooking lesson. Okay, so maybe she wasn't as bad as I first thought. We tried out different recipes together and came up with our own perfect formula. And finally, I could bake a lovely heart-shaped chocolate cake by myself to confess my love to Chris. And you know what? He said, yes. I was so deeply in love with Chris that I totally forgot about my conflict with Rochelle. Chris often came over to my place. My dad and Rochelle loved him. So now, besides my dad's favorite food, Rochelle also makes Chris's favorites too. She's incredible. She could remember everything Chris loves and hates, even the trivia, like he's allergic to peanuts. We were just like a family, and I have to admit, it felt kind of good. And then, out of literally nowhere, the shock of my life happened. My dad passed away from cancer. I didn't even know he was ill. As you might guess, I totally broke down and didn't want to do anything after that. My mom and dad had both left me just within a single year. 
but at least I still had Rochelle and Chris beside me. Rochelle took care of me like I was her actual daughter. I was going through such a tough time in life, but having them around made me feel like I wasn't completely alone. The grief had to fade away eventually, and it's gonna be okay from now on, I thought. Until one day, I was baking cupcakes when my dad's lawyer appeared and showed me the will. Turns out, my dad had left the house to me, but only on the condition that I had a guardian. Some woman named Laura. Huh? That's odd. I don't know anyone named Laura, but wait, I think I've heard this name from someone. Oh, my mom. When she was in her last days, mom once told me that my dad had been talking to his ex again, and her name was Laura. Could it be her? Did he seriously make his ex my guardian? Unbelievable! I had to get to the bottom of this. But how could I find this mystery Laura? I had no family. Well, besides my Uncle Colin, who was living in France. So I contacted him and told him everything. He flew back at once. And although I hadn't seen him in years, I couldn't hold back my emotions. And ended up sobbing on his shoulder. And then... He told me the horrible truth. Laura is none other than the woman who had just walked through the door. It was Rochelle, the woman who had been living in my house. I couldn't believe my ears. What on earth is going on? So Rochelle moving in was no coincidence? My dad sneakily snuck her in as a maid so they could be together? My pain and disappointment were overwhelming but I had to calm down so I could think rationally. I knew I needed to be smart and outplay Rochelle at her own game. Since then, I started watching Rochelle and noticed something strange. Rochelle and Chris were a bit too close and intimate. I often saw them whispering to each other when they thought I wasn't looking. What did this mean? Could it be that Rochelle was trying to coax my boyfriend into one of her dark schemes? Or worse still, was the guy I loved cheating on me with an older woman? My suspicions deepened. When a few days later, Chris told me he was sick, so I had to take the school bus for a couple of days. And Rochelle also asked me for a few days off. Hmm, could it just be coincidence? I didn't think so, so I decided to be a detective for once. Right after Rochelle left, I started following her. And with no surprise... She went to my boyfriend's house. Hi, Mom. Excuse me? Mom? She's his mom? So that means she not only flirted with my father, but also planted her son to distract me to take over my family's property? I trusted them. How could they be so cruel? Suddenly, I remembered a detail that I didn't notice until now. After eating the food she'd cooked, for some reason... My father became weaker and weaker, and eventually passed away. Did she poison him? If that's the case, then she really is a poisonous snake in human disguise. I immediately broke up with Chris, and fired Rochelle, then went home and told Uncle Colin everything. At least I had him on my side. Now what we need to do is refute her custody of the property. I'll take care of everything, and you just have to do what I say. Then... Uncle Colin helped me prepare a lawsuit against Rochelle and her son for fraud. Those two will pay the price for what they did to my father and me. Oh, but the thing is, now Rochelle didn't live here, it felt so empty. <sighs> I was so angry with her, but I also found myself missing her too. I loved and trusted her, and Chris too. And feelings like that don't just vanish overnight, but... When I was still thinking about it, there was the lawyer. Again! And he was accompanied by Uncle Colin. What's happening now? Miss Brittany Jensen hereby transfers the entire estate of 25 Oakwell House to Mr. Colin Jensen, as signed by both parties. Huh? Signed? When did I sign that? I snatched the paper and shouted, Scam! I never saw this paper! Uncle, what is this? Please say something. I don't know. Just follow the legal documents. No, 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 no! So Uncle Colin was just pretending to care, when really he just wanted to trick me into signing over my house? Oh, God. 
thinking about it. It must have been that day, the day where he gave me a bunch of papers to sign, claiming that they were about me suing Rochelle and Chris. OMG, the lying con! At the time, I'd been so upset that I only skimmed the first page without looking at the following ones. I was too careless. From tomorrow, Miss Brittany Jensen will have to return all assets to Mr. Colin Jensen. You have 24 hours to prepare. I tried shouting at my uncle, and then I tried reasoning with him, but he didn't care. He just smirked at me and told me that he was just taking what was rightfully his. Ugh, what a vile man. So now, I have nothing left. I was kicked out of my own house and deceived by my own uncle. I don't know why I accidentally passed Chris's house just as he opened the door to take a delivery and our eyes met. I turned and started to run away, but Chris caught up with me and grabbed my hand. Even after the awful way I treated them both, Rochelle and Chris still invited me inside and made me dinner. I ashamedly told them what happened. Then Rochelle told me everything. It turns out that my father found out that he had cancer a while ago, but he didn't tell me because he saw how upset I was after losing mom, and he was afraid I would worry too much. Rochelle saw his health deteriorating and figured out what was wrong, so she volunteered to take care of him because she still cared for him. But as a friend, nothing more. As for the will, my dad understood Uncle Colin all too well and didn't trust him, so he gave custody to Rochelle, but unexpectedly, in the end, I still stupidly fell into his trap. As for Chris, I really didn't know you two knew each other until you brought him home. But at that time, I didn't want to confess I was his mother and affect your relationship. I'm sorry, Brittany. Britt, please stay here with me and Mom. We'll get through this tough time together, okay? That's right, darling. No matter what, we'll never abandon you. I... I... I'm sorry. I misunderstood you both. It's okay. Everything will be fine from now on. You'll never have to do this alone. Yeah. Every dog has its day. This is totally not wrong. My life is nothing like my previous wealthy one, but I have something that my conniving, vulturous uncle doesn't have, and that's people who love and care about me. What my uncle did was wrong, and Rochelle and Chris are helping me to make a legal case against him. As for now, well, I still haven't given up on my passion for cooking and still practice with my master every day. <laughs> and you know what? I just won first prize at the city cooking competition. Right, I better go, as I have a big treat planned for Rich. Hi, it's Amelia again. In the second part of my story, Jude started working in the restaurant, and at first, it was a total disaster. He made a mess everywhere he set foot in. He was driving me totally crazy. But then things started to change. Turns out, he was a pretty talented chef that could help me with housework, and at work, he was becoming quite popular. One day, he got a date with a pretty girl, which annoyed me so much, but then I found him in the park playing with stray cats instead of going on that date. Honestly, that made me feel so happy. Has he really changed? To find out, let's see what happened next. At the restaurant, there was a new waiter called Oliver, who was a year younger than me. Our manager asked me to look after him and show him the ropes. To be honest, I was really impressed with Oliver, as he was such a sweet guy and a fast learner too. Pretty soon, we became closer, and he was like my little brother. Jude, however, did not like him one bit. He was always shouting at Oliver, and even complained that he was careless and clumsy. Um, talk about the pot calling the kettle black. We all knew that Jude was the clumsiest guy in the world. Anyway, Jude's birthday was coming up, and I wanted to buy him a new shirt, seeing as he mainly was wearing old clothes from the donation center. I wanted it to be a surprise, so I asked Oliver to come shopping with me, as Jude and Oliver were pretty much the same size. After buying a beautiful sweatshirt for Jude, Oliver took me home, and as we approached my house, I spotted Jude pacing up and down outside. Was he waiting for someone? When he saw that it was Oliver who gave me a ride, he looked angry and stormed into the house. I quickly said bye to Oliver and ran in. 
and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The table was set with a whole bunch of delicious-looking dishes, and there were even candles and flowers. I was so confused. Had he invited a girl over for a date? How dare he? I asked him what it was for, and he said, What day is it today? Did you forget it? Oh, so all of this was for his birthday party? I just laughed and handed him the gift bag. He immediately looked so happy. What a child. But then he suddenly gave me a doubtful look and asked, But what did you do in the afternoon? And with that Oliver guy? I told him I'd asked Oliver to help me go shopping for his birthday. And then I jokingly said, But why are you suddenly so curious? Why, you looked so annoyed upon seeing him. Are you jealous or something? I wasn't expecting what happened next. He suddenly blushed and muttered out, Actually, yes, I like you, Amelia. In fact, I, um, I think I'm in love with you. Whoa! What? I totally froze and didn't know what to say, but just kept looking at him and gasped. He could see I was speechless, so he waved his hands in front of me and said, Hello, Earth to Amelia. Then he continued, Well, Amelia, do you, um, have feelings for me too? Actually, never mind. It's not important. I mean, if you don't, then just forget it and we can go back to being friends. Oh god, I had never seen him so shy before. His face went red as a tomato and he kept scratching his head shyly. I couldn't help laughing as, honestly, he looked so cute. So I grabbed his hands and I couldn't stop the words from pouring out of my mouth. Jude, honestly, I... I like you too. My heart was racing as I said that, and I didn't know what else to say. But suddenly he was hugging me tightly, and then the next moment we were kissing. I was over the moon. I hadn't realized how much I'd wanted that to happen. It felt amazing. From that moment on, we were inseparable. We lived together, worked together, and in our spare time we went camping, hung out in the park, and cycled to watch the sunset. He cared about me so much, and I don't think I'd ever been that happy in my life before. I didn't think life could be that great. Then, one day, while we were cleaning the house, he suddenly called me. Amelia, look! How cute these pictures are! You drew them, right? Wow, you're gifted! I realized he was looking at my box of comic books I'd drawn, which I'd hid under the bed. I felt kinda embarrassed and told him that I hadn't done any drawings in a while. Then he asked me why I stopped, and I told him about how it had always been my dream to go to art college, but since my mum passed away, I'd had to forget it for a while and focus on just surviving. Jude suddenly grabbed my hands and said, Honey, let's make this dream happen. I'll help you, okay? I was so touched and gave him the biggest hug as a response. Jude was my everything. And best of all, he always supported me. And now, he encouraged me to follow my dream, too. Time went on, and everything was going amazingly. Until one day, when everything changed. Jude and I were out walking, when a luxury black car stopped next to us. A random guy appeared, and told us to get in the car. I freaked out and grabbed Jude's arm. What was happening? Were we being kidnapped? There was no way we were getting in the car, but suddenly the guy said, Jude, this is an order from your parents. Jude looked shocked and said, What do they want? They already kicked me out, so why should I come back? They want to show me how happy they are without me or something? But still, Jude climbed in the car, and I had no choice but to follow him. On the way, there were so many questions running through my head, but I just kept quiet. A short while later, we stopped in front of a mansion. This must have been Jude's house. Whoa, I knew he came from a rich family, but not to this extent. Jude held my hand and led me inside, where a couple, probably his parents, was sitting and waiting for us. Jude immediately shouted at them, saying, What do you want? I moved out just like you wanted, so why can't you leave me alone? I had never seen Jude so angry before. 
It actually scared me. His parents looked calm, though, and they just sat there smiling, and then his mom asked him to calm down and take a seat. The next moment, a maid appeared and brought us some water, but she accidentally spilled some, and she looked mortified. She kept apologizing and wiping it up, but Ju took the tissue and started cleaning it for her. Then he politely said to her that he would come help her make the pot of tea. Jude's parents looked shocked, but somewhat content, and asked Jude to stay as they had something important to tell him. They couldn't stop grinning. It was so weird. Then they told us their news, which shocked me to my core. Jude actually was their biological son. They'd lied to him because he'd had such a bad attitude, and they just wanted to teach him a lesson and force him to grow up a bit. They were sick of doing everything for him, and thought maybe moving out for a while would inspire him to become independent and realize the true value of family and money. What? I couldn't believe what I had heard! They kicked him out to help him grow up? That almost sounded like nonsense, but I guess it had worked, right? He had changed. But how could they come up with such a crazy plan? Of course, Jude wasn't okay with this. In fact, he was furious. What did you say? He screamed. Am I a joke to you or something? His mom tried to calm him down and said, Jude, honey, it was the only way. You were out of control, partying every night and spending all our money. We didn't know what else to do. We've been so worried about you. But son, we're so proud of you. Then his dad continued. We've always been keeping an eye on you, son. We saw you working in that restaurant, and we are just so happy you've turned a corner and found this independence. Then she turned to me and said, Amelia, right? Thank you so much, dear. You've looked after our son better than we ever could, and you've helped him so much. I just blushed and said, No, it's Jude who takes care of me, actually. He's been amazing. Jude was squeezing my hand tightly, and I could see how shocked he was. Over the past six months, he'd been on a complete roller coaster. From being abandoned by his parents, to discovering that they'd lied to him just to teach him a lesson. I couldn't believe they'd done it. But to be honest, I was grateful. Otherwise, I wouldn't have met him, and he might still be out there dating gold diggers and partying his life away. So I turned to him and said, Babe, I know it hurts right now, but your parents did what they thought was best for you. Plus, thanks to that, you were able to realize who your true friends were. Right? The ones who don't take advantage of you because of your money? It took a few moments, but then he gave me a gentle smile, and it was like he finally understood everything. He looked at his parents and said, You guys are crazy, but if you hadn't done something so ridiculous... I'd never have met Amelia. She's made me the man I am today. Without her, and without both of you, I'd never have changed. Gosh, I miss you both. Mom, Dad, thank you. At that, they all burst into tears and started hugging, and I just stood there, the tears pouring down my cheeks too. Watching them reunite like that was so touching, and it really made me miss my own mom. After that, we left, and as we were walking home in silence, Jude suddenly stopped and turned to me. Amelia, thank you. Thank you for never giving up on me, and for taking care of me. And now, it's my turn. I want you to go to art college and make your dreams a reality. Don't worry about money or anything. Just go make your mom and me proud. I was speechless. I started crying again and gave him the biggest hug of my life. And guess what? We've moved into a new place downtown, and I'm about to start our college next week. Jude is working in his dad's company, and I have a feeling we're going to get engaged soon. Don't tell Jude, but I found the ring box he hid in his wardrobe, though. But I'll surely say yes, and then we can get married after I graduate. It has been a crazy journey, but I wouldn't want it to be any other way. I'm so excited for what's to come. Wish me luck!
Hey, Kelly here. So, my dreams of being a part of an amazing school band, well, they weren't going so well. After a catastrophic prom performance, we all decided to go our separate ways. At least it was until Cole, the hottest boy in freshman year, walked into the room. There he was, smiling in the doorway and holding his electric guitar. So Joe glared at him and said, What do you want? He replied, Um, I know there isn't any member recruitment going right now, but I'd like to join the band if you guys... I was about to tell him that there was no band anymore, but Mia spoke first. Yes, sure, of course. Then she rushed over to him and dragged him across the room. Daisy looked puzzled and said, But weren't we already disbanded? Then Jill said, Daisy, you must have misheard us. We said we wanted to expand our brand, not disband. Is this for real? Wow, it's amazing what a cute guy can do. So I just nodded and then said, um, okay then, I guess. Welcome to the band. Okay, so think about it. This guy might not be in any way musically gifted. Not that it mattered. Because of him, there was currently still a band. And surely girls would come and see us now, even if we sucked. I mean, he's Cole Henderson. For Valentine's Day, he got at least 40 cards. They all fell out of his locker. It was crazy. So, we started practicing. And wow, it turned out Cole had an amazing voice. And he could play electric guitar like a pro. Mia even volunteered to step down and be backing vocals. What was going on? And Daisy was happy not to have to sing anymore and just concentrate on playing bass. Having Cole around solved a lot of our problems. The prom incident was completely forgotten. No more Mia and Jill fighting for the spotlight, but there was one thing. I knew they both had crushes on Cole. I mean, it was so obvious. Mia dressed up for every practice. I mean, she always makes an effort with her appearance, but glittery dresses on a normal school day? That was so over the top. Then, there was Jill. Whenever Cole was around, she was so polite to everyone and complimented us on everything. I knew they were low-key competing with each other, as one time Jill's drumstick disappeared, and while she was looking for them, Mia went over to Cole and felt his arm and asked him if he'd been working out. Then another time, Mia's lipstick was replaced with a black one, which she applied before practice. Horrified, she ran into the bathroom to wash it off, and Jill went over to Cole and asked him to teach her how to play guitar while we waited for Mia. The band was certainly eventful, but I had to admit, I was enjoying myself. We even decided on a name, Rouge September. This named after three of us have birthdays in September, and Mia and Cole's favorite color is red, but Mia insisted on using the French word for it to be more edgy. Yep, it took us hours to come up with that, but I like it. I like it a lot. We really started to improve and had lots of fun doing it. Then Cole suggested we play One Direction's What Makes You Beautiful at this upcoming school concert. I loved the song, so I immediately agreed. Even Jill did, and I know she hates One Direction. So we rehearsed like crazy and everyone showed up on time and worked really hard. Yes, Mia and Jill's low-key competing continued, but whatever. At least we were all there practicing. The night of the performance arrived and I was mixed of excited and scared. Cole helped me set up my keyboard stand and I noticed that he kept on giving me funny looks. Before I could ask him what was up, it was time to perform. We were so amazing and everyone was cheering for us. Then the song ended and Cole started to talk into the microphone. Um, thanks guys. You were awesome. But um, there's something I want to say. Then he looked at me. Kelly... I just want to let the whole world know that you're the most beautiful girl and I really enjoyed getting to know you for the past few months and well, I'd love it if you could be my girlfriend. What was that? Was he out of his mind? Since when did he have feelings for me? The crowd went crazy, screaming and cheering while I froze there. I could see Jill and Mia were looking at me with fury eyes. Cole tried to walk towards me and say something, but the microphone didn't work. Jill had just unplugged it and Mia charged towards me screaming, You traitor! Cole is mine! Cole jumped in front of me to protect me from her. Then Daisy suddenly burst into tears, like hysterically. We all looked at each other immediately knew, Oh boy, she must have had a crush on Cole too. 
The next thing we knew, a teacher walked on stage and shooed us off. That's when I noticed the whole crowd gapping at us and laughing. Jeez, this was so humiliating. Worse still, we walked off stage and the school director said, So, you think that was funny, do you? Let's see if you're still laughing in detention. Then he locked us all in a classroom and said we could only leave when we understood what we did wrong and resolved everything. There is no way I wanted to talk to any of them about this mess. Thanks to them, I look like a fool. And now I had detention while I hadn't even done anything. It was some five minutes of awkward silence until Cole shyly started. Okay, we can't just sit here in silence for however long. Look. I like Kelly, and the concert was a great opportunity for me to confess my feelings. That's all. Was he serious right now? This was the last thing he needed to say right now. Jill suddenly fueled up again and turned to me yelling, You've been seducing Cole even though you knew I liked him? Cole tried to chime in. Guys, this is not how it works. Mia also came at me. You don't deserve to be our leader. You're so sneaky. Then there went Daisy, bursting out crying again. Jill tried to comfort her while Mia said, Another victim of beauty, huh? Daisy stuttered through tears. Why, why do you get everything? You got to be the leader. You got the cute boy. You get all the attention. Jill rolled her eyes. Yeah, so you're the lamest leader. So lame, my dog could do better. That was it. I'd had enough of these selfish people. I couldn't hold back anymore and screamed at them. Oh, yeah? You think being a leader is easy? I guess you guys have never spared your precious seconds to think about how much I've done for you all. I got you a platform for the drum, a freaking mask, a dumb rhinestone microphone. You asked for it. I delivered it. It's all because I love this band. I want to have an actual band, a successful music club. I want to leave a legacy here at this school to make our high school years meaningful but all i'm getting is hate and some selfish friends that i don't know if i could call friends anymore i didn't know cole liked me in fact i had no idea i guess i was being too busy trying to keep this club together to notice but no more i'm done i was out of breath after that and when i finished i saw them all looking at me stunned Detention or no detention, I grabbed my stuff and I was about to leave when Mia timidly said, Um, sorry, I guess it's true. I really haven't thought. Jill added, Yeah, you should have told us earlier. I'm sorry, I didn't know this really meant that much to you. Daisy wiped her tears. Yes, and please don't say that, Kelly. Of course, we're still friends. Please forgive us. Cole was about to say something too, then Mia quickly covered his mouth. Nah, nah, kid. This is our business. Now, Kelly, what do you say? Could you please take us back as your adorable friends and bandmates? Then, all three of them gathered up and looked at me with puppy eyes, trying to make me smile. I tried to keep my straight face, but eventually, I burst out laughing and hugged them all. Then, Daisy cried again, which set all of us off. Even Jill. Cole was sitting there looking at us oddly. When Mia noticed this, she pointed at him and said, That boy was the one who broke us apart. Don't understand why we were so swooned over him. I wish I knew you were trouble when you walked in. Oh my god, did you just quote Taylor Swift? You know it's Taylor Swift, (laughs) Daisy laughed. But you're right, I'm so over him now. Yep, stupid crush, Jill agreed. I waved Cole over to join the group hug as I said, Guys, remember that Cole was the one who saved us when we were on the verge of disbandment. He deserves some credit. What do you mean on the verge? We were already disbanded, Mia joked. Then Jill added, Wow, we've been through it all. Now I guess we can get over everything together too, right guys? I said, Yes, that's the spirit. Now on three. One, two, three. Rouge September, let's go! You thought this was the end to it? Nah, not quite. Later that day when I was walking back home, Cole ran after me. Hey Kelly, look, I'm sorry, I had no idea what this club meant to you. Please forget all about my confession and let's be friends. I want to help you with the ban and everything. I smiled at him, I'd like that. So, peace was restored and as for Rouge September, well, we're still going. Who knows, one day we might be the greatest band on earth. But yeah, having close friends, being together every day, and playing music together is enough for me. But then, something weird started happening. I found myself smiling when I looked at Cole and noticing how cute he was when he tuned his guitar. Did I like, like him?
No, it couldn't be, could it? I mean, if I did that, then that meant I had to confess to him this time around, right? But here's a thought, it surely won't be on stage. When my boyfriend and I broke up before heading off to different universities, I never imagined that my love life would take a pretty dramatic turn, where I ended up being the third wheel in an affair. Let me backtrack a bit. I'm Juliana, a 19-year-old amateur marathon runner. I'd been a part of a running club for the past five years that met twice a week. And during that time, I became quite close to two of the runners there. They were both much older than me, but we got on well. Leo was a middle-aged bachelor, and Charlotte was a mom of two and had been married for more than 20 years. They both worked together in the same trading company, and I can't really explain it, but we all just clicked. We always ran together, but one morning, Leo didn't turn up. That was odd because he never missed a session. Anyway, Charlotte and I ran together, and that night I received a message from Leo asking if I wanted to have dinner with him. I was a bit surprised, but... This was Leo's first time inviting me to a private meal, but I still said yes, and we went to a restaurant downtown. At dinner, we got into some deep conversations, and at one point, I asked him, why have you stayed single till now? He stopped a bit and replied to me, um, it's hard to say, but I've just had a bad breakup a few years ago, and I wasn't ready to get into another relationship. Oh, that's why he decided to stay single, even though he's a pretty successful and attractive man. It was quite awkward after that, so I broke the silence by asking him why he hadn't come running that morning, and he just said something had come up at work. He was acting a little strange, but I didn't push it. Anyway, it was a nice dinner, and afterwards we shared a cab home, as we lived on the same street. Well, that's when something weird happened. Charlotte was waiting on his doorstep. Leo looked shocked to see her there, and quickly ran out to check what was wrong. Charlotte hadn't seen me, so I wound the window down and happily waved to her, but to my complete surprise, she looked kind of annoyed. Then she just said they had work to do, and she hoped I got home safely. I didn't give it much thought, but in hindsight, oh, what kind of work project needs to be done at 10 p.m.? Anyway, I didn't give it much thought. Surely there couldn't have been anything going on, right? I mean, Charlotte and Leo are colleagues and also close friends. And I'd met Charlotte's family. Sure, her husband was away for work a lot, but they loved each other. And they had kids together. I got home and chilled for a bit. Then about an hour later, I received a text from Leo, asking if I'd like to join him for a midnight run. I immediately said yes. Well, to be honest, deep down, I totally had a bit of a crush on him. Even though I knew my parents would freak if they ever found out I was hanging out with a guy old enough to be my dad. It excites me, though. So I went for a run along the beach with him, and afterwards we got some takeaway food and sat on the sand, listening to the waves and watching the stars. I guess we were both high off adrenaline, and also it was such a romantic setting with all the city lights reflected on the water, so we got into a really deep conversation about relationships and what we want from love. Then one thing led to another, and we started kissing. We ended up spending the whole night on the beach and even watched the sunrise. When I got home, I couldn't stop smiling. But then I saw I had five missed calls from Charlotte. I quickly called her back, thinking something must have happened. But when she picked up, she just said, Where were you last night? I told her I was on a run, and she said, With who? So I said, With Leo? Um, why? And she just said, Oh, I was just curious. He wasn't answering my calls. Then we hung up. Um, how strange, I thought. Anyway, that night, Leo asked me if I wanted to have dinner together again. And of course I said yes. I was dying to know if last night had just been a one-night makeout sesh, or if it could mean something more. When I saw him, I said to him, Leo, sorry about last night. I got carried away, and I'm like half your age. I shouldn't have done that. Oh, I don't know what I was thinking. I expected him to say it was okay, and that he enjoyed it like I did. But instead, he said, yeah, let's just pretend that nothing happened. I felt so awkward after that but I couldn't deny my feelings for him. After that, we got even closer, though. We spent more time together and spoke on the phone every night for hours. Then one night, Charlotte called me 
and said she'd had a fight with Leo and that's why she'd gone to his place the week before. Ah, now it all made sense. So that's why they hadn't been coming to the running club together. She said they still hadn't made up, and she needed someone to talk to. She sounded upset, but wouldn't tell me what the fight was about. Then she asked if we could meet up, although it was quite awkward. I had to tell her I was actually going to the theater with Leo. Leo and I both love going to the theater, and that night we had tickets to see Shakespeare in the park. She asked why we hadn't invited her to join, and I said she could totally join us, but obviously it was too late to get tickets. Then she just hung up. Next days, I realized that Charlotte and Leo would only attend alternate running sessions so that they could avoid each other. I talked to both Leo and Charlotte about it, but they simply claimed that their work was getting stressful and hence they could only handle one training session a week. Then one Friday morning, I noticed Charlotte was in a seriously foul mood. Normally she was so upbeat, so I asked her what was up, and that's when she told me. She'd been having an affair with Leo for the past three years. I was shook. I mean, I guess I should have seen it coming, but I still couldn't hide my shock. I'd thought of her as such a role model, with this amazing family and a great job. And yet, here she was, nothing but a cheat. And with Leo, the guy I was seeing. Oh my god, what kind of mess had I got involved in? Charlotte begged me to keep it a secret, but I couldn't even speak. I was in complete denial. If she knew what Leo and I had been up to? And yet, why did it matter? She was the one having an affair, not me. I continued to see Leo, and one time he even invited me over to watch a movie at his place. And we made out again. It was amazing. But at the same time, I had Charlotte calling me every night for moral support, which made things really weird. For the next month or so, Leo and I kept meeting up, and I loved it. But I knew that if Charlotte found out, she'd kill me. It was such a dilemma. Then one night, she called me and said, If you're my friend, Juliana, you'll stop seeing Leo. Please, I'm begging you. I couldn't believe it. How did she know? Um, sorry, Charlotte. How did you find out? She said it was a woman's sixth sense, and that she'd known ever since the night when I'd been in the cab with him. Plus, she said it was obvious that I'd had a crush on him for a while. All right, but why do you care if I'm still with Leo? You're married. He's single. He can do whatever he wants, I said to her. Then she said, please, for my sanity, please stop seeing him. I'm jealous, okay? It hurts to know you're together. Plus, he's not a good guy. Well, that did it. I wasn't going to break the sisters before misters rule. So I stopped seeing Leo. I couldn't hurt Charlotte like that even though she was actually the one hurting her whole family by having this affair. Not seeing Leo made me miss him so much, but I told myself I had to keep my word to Charlotte. And yet you won't believe what happened next. Charlotte started seeing Leo again. I was so angry. She'd asked me to stop seeing him and had even said he wasn't a good guy. All so she could have him to herself again? What kind of married woman does that? Honestly, I was raging. One morning after running, I marched over to her and said, Do you not have any self-respect? What about your poor husband? Charlotte went bright red and said, I'm trying my best. I know you're right, and I should respect myself and my husband more. You know what? From now on, I will keep my distance from Leo, just like you. Trust me. Okay, so at least she had the decency to say that and I hoped she could do exactly what she said. After that, I decided to take a break out of this complicated three-person relationship and try to forget about Leo. I avoided him at the running club, and he avoided me too. Charlotte told me she'd spoken to him about dating me and how inappropriate it was for him to date someone as young as me, so maybe that's why the feeling was mutual. And he avoided me too. After all, it's better that way. He was way too old for me anyway. Plus, I was heading off to university, so it was all for the best. About Charlotte, after I confronted her, we actually became closer. And even now that I'm at university, she still calls me sometimes to ask how I'm doing. I asked her about Leo, and you won't believe it, but apparently Leo is now dating someone. Okay, I guess that's better for everyone. Although I sometimes wonder, if they break up, will he start up his affair with Charlotte again? Well, it's a story about my ebullient youth, when I got into so much trouble just because I fell in love with a middle-aged man. That whole period of my life was such a weird and messy time, right? 
But now I'm so glad I've met a nice guy my own age. And of course, I never want to get involved in being a third wheel ever again. Hi, my name is Mia, and I lived the first 14 years of my life trapped in a lie. I never left the house. And by that, I mean never. I grew up believing that I was allergic to the sun, and if I stayed out in it too long, I'd turn to dust. Dumb, I know, but I was just a kid, and I had no reason not to believe what my mom told me. On the rare occasions, I went out into the backyard, and my skin turned all blotchy and puffy. Looking back on it now, it's clear mom had given me something to bring my skin out in a rash, but at the time, I honestly believed the sun was out to get me. I remember peering behind the curtain and watching the kids play out in the street. They looked like they were having so much fun, and I felt so sad that I couldn't join them. Mom charged into my room, quickly closed the curtain, and then she grabbed my shoulders and shouted at me. Mia, never do that again. The sun can come in through the curtains and turn you to a crisp. Is that what you want? I remember sobbing as I shook my head. I never did peer out at the other kids again after that. I could still hear them playing, so I would close my eyes and imagine that I was out there with them, playing chase and learning how to ride a bike. I so wanted that to be my reality. The problem was I didn't have that life. Instead, I was stuck inside with no friends. I'd never even touched the grass before. Mom homeschooled me. She took this really seriously and got really mad when I didn't understand something. One time, I gave the wrong answer to a math equation, so she screamed at me. You're such an idiot! I've had enough of you! Then she locked me in my room without dinner. Crazy, huh? But back then, I was so scared that from then, I didn't dare to ask her anything. It's always just mom and me, and no one else in my house. She said my dad had died when I was a baby. Again. I had no reason not to believe her. I never had a phone to talk to anyone, and who did I have to talk to? Still, I remember being fascinated by this strange object she often pressed to her ear. Whenever she was on the phone, I believed she was talking to herself. Mom would lock me in the house while she went out. Then when she returned, she'd just throw me something to eat. A sandwich, a packet of potato chips, and sometimes she changed the meal to bread. She never really cooked. I'm not even sure if she knew how to. My house was a simple old house. There's not many things in it. No TV, no sofa, a basic kitchen. I mean, it looks like an abandoned house, but I thought it was normal because I'd not seen any other houses. My room was small, cold, and dark. I only had a hard mattress and some itchy old pillows. I didn't even have a bed cover. I used to shiver myself to sleep each night and dream of being out there playing with the other kids. Then. Things got worse when I turned 10. Mom stormed into my room, gave me some food and a pile of books, and told me that I had to stay in my room from now on so she knew I was safe. I put up with four years of this. It was horrible. She chucked my meals at me and gave me new books once a week. I felt so hungry and lonely all the time. Then one day, when evening arrived and she still hadn't fed me, my hunger pains got the better of me. So I tried the door, and to my surprise, it wasn't locked. So I snuck downstairs. That's when I saw Mom pacing the room, her phone in hand. She said, Yes, I know, Toby. Well, she's finally of age, so when are you coming to get her? Then she said, Tomorrow at 10 a.m. I will be counting the money. I didn't know what was going on, but I knew something wasn't right. Then I heard Mom say, Well, I suppose I better go and feed her then. I quickly darted upstairs and lay on my mattress. Mom appeared and passed me a sandwich and some water. She sat down next to me, which was odd, as she hardly ever did this, and she smiled at me as she said, We need to get you cleaned up, and I've bought you a new dress to wear. Why, Mom? I asked her. Her smile faded into a scowl, and she kicked my mattress. Why do you always have to be so insolent? I didn't want to upset her further, so I didn't ask her anything else. Then the next day, Mom made me put the new dress on and let me out of my room. Then there was a knock at the door, and Mom brought this strange man in. 
I'd never interacted with anyone other than mum before, so I just sat there, feeling afraid. He was around my mum's age and tall, really tall, and he had unkind eyes. He passed my mum an envelope, and she opened it and took out a lot of bits of paper. I know now that this was money, but back then, I didn't fully understand what it was. Mum counted it out, then nodded at him and said, She's all yours. Right. You're coming with me, sweetie. He walked towards me. Wh- what I stared at him, open-mouthed. Mia, you're going to live with this man now. Mom said it like it was no big deal. That's what happens when you turn 14. You have to leave. But Mom, why? I don't know him. I won't go. Then she slapped me and shouted out loud, Go with him. I'm done with you. That's when I realized that I couldn't live with this woman anymore. I ran out of the front door. Surely turning to dust was better than living with any of them. Only, as the sun touched my skin, it didn't burn. That's when I knew Mum had been lying to me all this time. So I started running without knowing where I was going. I could hear Mum and that Toby guy chasing and shouting after me, but I just kept on running. Every little sound freaked me out, as I didn't understand this world and the people in it. The next thing I remember is some woman shaking me and saying, Sweetie, are you okay? I was so afraid at first and curled up into a ball, but then she told me she wasn't going to hurt me, she just wanted to help me. She had kind eyes, not like Mom or that man, so I told her what had happened. She looked completely shocked, but she rang the police. So, it turns out that when I was a baby, I was stolen. My mom isn't really my mom at all. She was some messed up woman who took me out of my pushchair and made some awful deal with that Toby man that he could buy me off her when I was 14. She didn't know my real parents. She just saw a chance to grab me and she took it. It's horrible to think that she robbed me of a normal life, but I try not to dwell on this thought too much. I can't change the past. Then eventually, something amazing happened. My real parents were found. It was so emotional seeing them for the first time. They hugged me and we all just cried. They told me how they'd never stopped looking for me. And guess what? I found out I have a little sister called Izzy. I love hanging out with her and watching her play. She's the best. It's been hard. There's so much I've had to learn, such as how to interact with people and even how to eat with a knife and fork. My real parents have been so kind and patient with me. Now, at the age of 19, I have some sort of normal life. I still find many things confusing, and I struggle being around large crowds. I had to get used to sleeping on a bed, and I find computers the most confusing thing ever. But I manage to function in the big, wide world. As for my fake mom and Toby, well, they were both sentenced for their involvement in my kidnap and are now in jail for a very long time. I have a chance at leading a normal life in the normal world, and even though what happened to me was horrible, I'm not going to let those cruel people ruin my life. I finally have a loving family, and I know that with their care and support, I can get through anything. Hey guys, Milo here. Again, I'm going to share with you the final part of my awesome story. And trust me, you won't want to miss it. For those of you who are struggling to keep up, in the second part, I decided to make a move with Vanessa, despite knowing that she's the little sister of my horrible ex. And also, she was dating this thug, Kane. The only thing that matters is that she had feelings for me too. So I convinced Vanessa to dress sloppily so Kane would end it with her. Of course, my genius plan worked. Then we started dating officially. But I didn't want Vanessa to find out the truth about my past relationship with her sister. So I made up some ridiculous story to her about how I wasn't ready to face seeing her beloved sis yet, as she was the mean girl that had made my life a living hell back in middle school. Anyway, Kane found out about Deanna being my ex. And now he's threatening to tell Vanessa everything unless I set him up on a date with my sister Kayla. I know. Complicated, huh? I swear my life is just one big soap opera. Anyway, tuck luff, sis. 
Seems like you have a date with Creepy Kane this Saturday. Okay, so the fact she already has a boyfriend makes things somewhat complicated. I guess there was only one thing for it. I'd just have to trick her into going on the date. So, Kayla loves singing. I mean, she's tone deaf, but she thinks she's Katy Perry or something. So I figured that the most logical way to trick her into meeting Kane was to come up with some story about a talent agent being interested in her. I told her that I had a friend who had a friend who knew a talent agent. And this agent would just love to have dinner with her on Saturday and talk about her career. At first, she raised her eyebrow and said, as if. So I let out a long sigh, then replied, as much as it pains me to admit that you have talent, well, you do. So meet the agent or don't, as if I care. I shrugged. Then I walked off. I hadn't got far when she shouted after me, yeah, okay, I'll be there. Result. I knew that my sister wouldn't be able to resist the prospect of getting one up on me. It's a shame for her that this would never happen. Of course, I wasn't a complete jerk. Kane's a volatile idiot. So the least I could do was secretly follow her to make sure she was safe. I sat in the restaurant in my sunglasses, stick-on mustache and baseball cap. Talk about the master of disguise. I should open up a spy business. Kayla was far too busy droning on about herself to notice me. She didn't seem to recognize Kane as being Vanessa's ex either. Probably because he'd actually washed his hair. And was that aftershave I could smell? I overheard her say to him, So do you really think I can make it as a singer? Kane looked confused, but he just shrugged and said, Um, yeah, sure. Even though she wouldn't quit going on about her singing, he still continued to flirt with her. Lame things like he told her she looked pretty and stroked her arm. Ugh. At one point, Kayla started singing. Kane looked dumbfounded, and the waiter walking past actually covered his ears. It was so funny, even I couldn't help but laugh out loud. Then she must have had a light bulb moment about who he was, as she gave him a scrutinizing look, stood up, then said, Wait a minute, um, yeah, excuse me? I, I need the bathroom. As she stormed across the room, I knew she was bailing. Oh no. If she did that, then Kane would tell Vanessa everything, and my life would be over. So I hurried after her and shouted her name. At first, she gave me a weird look, so I removed my sunglasses and fake mustache. She looked pretty mad. But I knew that I had to tell her all about how Kane was blackmailing me. I even managed to fake some tears. At first, she seemed furious, and she shouted at me. A lot. But then she seemed to calm down, and she smirked. Uh-oh. That smirk didn't look good. She told me, okay, I'll go back inside. But this means you have to do everything I say all month. I didn't like the sound of this, but I had little choice. So I agreed. She went back inside and the date seemed to go well. The problem was now I didn't have to worry about Kane. Instead, I had to worry about my sister. Why do these situations happen to me? Has karma for messing with all those couples come back to bite me? I had to do all Kayla's chores, including staying home every weekend to babysit the kid next door. <clears throat> then I also had to message her actual boyfriend and apologize for the Valentine's prank I played on him. A reminder for you, it involved my super speed and a whole lot of duct tape. Things got weirder though, as Kane seemed totally smitten with my sister. He sent her flowers, then he sent her a giant teddy bear. And he even messaged me saying he wanted to assure me he would never hurt her. Okay, this was weird. It seems my sister had made the once thug-like cane turn soft. Thing is, she binned his flowers, gave the teddy to the neighbor's kid, and, well, made it clear she didn't like him. Wow. Love can really mess someone up. Even someone like Kane. I guess he liked her coldness toward him. I suppose it's far more of a challenge than being with someone all kind and sweet like Vanessa. Kayla had started selling home-baked goods, you know, cookies and things. They were tough, burned, and gross, but people seemed to buy them. So guess who she roped into playing delivery driver? Urgh, talk about lame. What made it even worse was I had a date with Vanessa one day. But no, now I had to deliver inedible biscuits. Being the smart guy I am, I found a way to get around this. So I picked Vanessa up from the library, then went off to make the deliveries. The plan was to drop them off as quickly as possible, then Vanessa and I could have date night. 
Vanessa didn't mind. In fact, she thought it was sweet that I was helping Kayla out. (laughs) Ha! We got to the delivery address, and it was a nail salon. I left Vanessa in the car and rushed inside. Then I saw who the customer was, and oh my god. There standing in front of me was Deanna. Talk about a shocker. I was so surprised that I actually dropped the delivery. I muttered out something about how my sister would reimburse her. Then I went to leave. She grabbed my arm and said she wanted to apologize to me properly for cheating on me. Now was not the time for this. Talk about awkward. I tried to yank my arm away, but she kept clinging to me. Then Vanessa suddenly walked in. I guess she must have seen us through the shop window. She yelled out, Deanna, what are you doing? Let him go. Stop being so mean. I didn't want to believe that you ever teased him back in middle school, but here's the proof. Deanna looked confused as she replied, What are you doing here? And what do you mean tease? They yelled back and forth in confusion for a while until Deanna blurted out, He's my ex-boyfriend! Cue two furious women staring at me in anger asking for an explanation. Now would be the perfect time for a UFO to come and abduct me, but no such luck. I had some explaining to do, so we went to the coffee shop next door and I confessed that Deanna was actually my ex. But I only found out about it after dating Vanessa, so I lied because I didn't know how to handle that awkward situation. I begged them for forgiveness. I was so scared. I was basically staring down at the table the whole time. But then suddenly, I heard giggles. Deanna started to laugh and said, That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Oh my, Milo. Vanessa joined in. Okay, that makes sense since he's the one who also came up with the ridiculous plan for me to break up with my ex by playing ugly. He really has a unique sense of solving problems. Okay, so I never thought they'd find any of this funny, but at least they're not mad at me. So in the end, I got a proper apology from Deanna. We're cool now, and I can freely date Vanessa too. Turns out life is far simpler when you don't end up in a web of lies. As for Kane, well, he doesn't bother Vanessa anymore. Instead, he's still pining after my sister. I actually think he might have a chance with her, as she broke up with her boyfriend because that dude has been constantly bailing on her to hang out with his friends. Even though I've seen a different side to Kane, I don't know how I'd feel about having him as my actual brother-in-law one day. (laughs) But yeah, I got the girl, so everything turned out pretty great. As for pranks, well, I can't rule out never doing the odd one or two in the future, but... I promise to never mess with loved up couples again. I've learned my lesson on that one. How long is this gonna take? So much for taking care of me. Lex, starting today, I'm locking your phone and laptop away. Cruel! Isn't one leg cast enough punishment? Excuse me, you don't deserve to have a say in this. If you hadn't bought our daughter that death trap motorbike in the first place, she'd still be intact. Yeah, sorry for making sure she doesn't grow up boring like her mom. Yeah, another lecture on how irresponsible I was eventually turned into a quarrel between mom and dad instead. They stopped only when mom needed to leave for her business trip in Egypt. I'm done arguing with you. I have a flight to catch. I've got my eye on you, young lady. All the way from Egypt? That's kinda hard. Well, at least Dad's here, so I won't be by myself. The next morning, I woke up to see a note stuck to the fridge. Alex, I'm shooting my new movie in Spain for a few months. There is a strict no-phone policy to avoid leaks. So, if it isn't urgent, don't call me. Love, Dad. Seriously? Choosing work over me? Why am I still surprised? That's when you get when you have a world-famous actor dad and an award-winning photographer mom. They're rarely home, and whenever they are, they're constantly at each other's throats. All the more reason for me to hang out with my biker gang. I love motorcycles. They're my only getaway. But that's how I messed up my leg. In my defense, I could totally nail that trick and win their stupid bet if it wasn't for that bumpy road. However, not a single one of my homies has checked on me since then. Not even my boyfriend, Blake. But what's really bumming me out is that school's out for summer, yet I can hardly move. So, bored out of my mind, I came up with a new way to entertain myself, which was playing candid camera on this whole suburbia. 
Thanks to my mom's camera, I had eyes on the newlyweds Cunninghams on the right, the carpenters on the left, a few other houses, and ooh, tiny Timmy across the street. I swear to god, I almost thought some hunky guy had just moved in. My childhood friend Tiny Timmy had officially grown into Timothy. He looked just like a muscular version of Timothy Chalamet. Then Tim suddenly sat up and we accidentally made eye contact. Awkward. Looking good, handsome. He's even cuter when he smiles. Oh, he's replying. Even better up close. That's bold, Timmy. Too bad though. Sorry, lame. Tim looks confused at first. Then when he saw my cast, he immediately leaves the room. Huh? A broken leg is enough to scare him off? He's lame. Then the doorbell rang. Hey, that took a while. You're here? Of course, you need to have a closer look and could use a hand or a leg. Yeah, uh, I mean, <clears throat> come help this damsel in distress. From then on, Tim came over every day to help me out around the house. He'd been really helpful and even tried riding my motorcycle so it didn't have to sit idle for too long. Other than that bulked up body, he's still the friend I knew back in the day. We still had so much fun playing video games and watching movies together. You have to watch Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. It's nuts. Actually, I thought you might be into Ladybird. Such a heartwarming coming-of-age story. Ew, no way. Timothy Chalamet is in it. Okay, sold. But how do you know that it'd sway me? I just do. Like how I know you spy on me from time to time, which, by the way, is super creepy. Yeah, right. As if he didn't intentionally leave his blinds open while working out, Mr. Shy Guy. One day, as usual, me and Tim were hanging out, when suddenly my dear boyfriend Blake made a noisy entrance. Babe, you won't believe this. There's a raising tournament going on in the Upper West Side. You have to come. What's going on here? Sup. What do you mean, sup? Who's this little brat? Oh, this is Tim. Tim, this is Blake. Say hi. Hi. I don't care. What do you think you're doing? Watch your tongue. You've been ignoring me for weeks, and now you show up raving on about some dumb street racing contest? You don't even remember that I broke my leg, do you? But, but, you're mine! Blake was fuming like a bull ready for battle and about to throw hands at Tim, but he stopped his fist midair. A defeated-looking Blake fled off as soon as he got out of Tim's grip. Coward. I apologized to Tim for dragging him into this mess, and he was surprisingly cool about it. Just curious, how did Blake and you become a thing? He's the leader of the biker gang, so I thought he was cool, but honestly, I never expected our relationship to last, just like every other couple's. Exhibit A, my parents. I see. My dad's a good example as well. Then Tim revealed that his dad left his mom for another woman last year, which really upset him. I could relate so much to his situation. Maybe being locked up at home wasn't so bad after all, since we had the chance to catch up on everything. But the following morning, when I was chilling in my room, something horrible caught my eye. Something blonde. It looked like she was returning a hoodie to Tim. What kind of friend borrows a hoodie and acts like that around each other? Let's see what he has to say for himself. Who's that blonde? What was she doing at your place today? What? Who? She might look like strawberry shortcake, but don't be fooled. Whatever love you two might think you have will soon fade. That sweetness will turn sour in no time. Tim just burst out laughing. What's so funny? What made you think so? You don't even know Annabelle. <laughs> don't believe me? See for yourself. I then showed him all of the secrets I'd uncovered in our seemingly quiet neighborhood. First off, the couple from number 9 were both having affairs. The daughter from number 11 was using her boyfriend to hide her real relationship with another girl. And last but not least, the Carpenters, who seemed like suburban couples goal, actually had a far from blissful life due to Mr. Carpenter's drinking problem. In conclusion, there's no such thing as real love. I see your point, but on the other side of the spectrum, genuine love does exist. Tim points the camera towards the Cunninghams. Hmm, I'm not buying their poster couple act. Then, one day, Tim said he had to work overtime at the library to prepare for an event with, you guessed it, Annabelle only. I had to hide my anger as I watched him drive off with Blondie. With nothing else to do, I decided to watch the Cunninghams. Jeez, how could they seem so lovey-dovey all the time? I wanted to take my mind off of Tim, but the more I observed them, the more I thought about him with that Barbie. 
That's when I saw a book that Tim borrowed for me from the library. Looks like it's time to return it. I Ubered there, but there are many people here as well. Why did Tim say that the two of them would be here alone? Tim's face turned into the scream when he saw me. Didn't think I could get this far? Hi, don't mind me. I'm just here to return this. You should have just given it to me. Oh god, no. I can see that you're busy with... Annabelle, isn't it? Yeah. How do you know my name? Oh, let's see. You remind me of that creepy doll who's also an absolute nightmare. Tim then immediately dragged me away. See? He's caring for me, not you, Annie. However, the fun was interrupted right away when I saw Blake outside. Time for you to pay. Tim immediately stood between Blake and me, but to our surprise, Blake signaled for his goons hiding close by to show themselves. Clearly outnumbered, I tried to stop the situation from getting worse. Let's be civilized here. We can sort this out without violence. You're right, babe. We can settle this with a bet. Whoever can do the trick that broke Lex's leg and top it off with the Akira slide can have her fair and square. The loser has to back down. First of all, I'm not some kind of trophy. Second of all, that stunt is incredibly dangerous. Right, Tim? Sounds worth it, though. Have both of you lost your minds? Tim went first, and even though he flunked it, he managed to land without a scratch, while Blake landed on his face. Of course, that fiasco got the whole gang so embarrassed, they scrammed immediately. But I was still so annoyed. Congratulations, you won absolutely nothing. Not that I didn't care about him, I just couldn't stand his recklessness anymore. The next day, I was woken up by a doorbell. So, what are you here for? Sorry about last night. But if you stayed longer, I could have told you that I did what I did because I like you. Romantic styles. I don't even remember since when, but I do remember how sad I was when we stopped hanging out. Believe it or not, I started working out just to impress you. Whoa, what? Tim explained that nothing was going on between Annabelle and him. They were simply co-workers. And he made up that whole thing about being alone with her at the library to see my reaction. What do you say? I can make you believe in love. Tim, don't be ridiculous. Love isn't anything like the movies. It's merely a temporary chemical reaction in your brain that makes you think you're really feeling it. Come on, just give it a chance. No, look at my parents, your father, all the families in this neighborhood. If you ask me, your feelings for me right now will fade, just like mine with Blake. I'm sorry for wasting your time. I thought I was special enough for you to take a leap of faith. Now I know how wrong I was. He then left without another word. When Tim closed his blinds, honestly, I felt a sting in my chest. This is for the best, right? I can't deny the uneasiness I felt without Tim. It's not that he didn't want us to make up. I just didn't know how. Seeing how happy and smiley he was with her, my uneasy feeling only grew bigger. Is this what they call love? No, no, no. It's not real. Happy-looking families are not actually happy. And the Cunninghams are just good at faking it. What's that I'm hearing? Are they fighting? I saw the husband suddenly punch the wall with rage, then push the wife. I no longer had eyes on them, but could hear a huge commotion over there. What on earth is going on? Panicked, I called the cops right away. Wait a second. That means their happy marriage really was fake. I excitedly limped across the street to tell Tim about my discovery, then dragged him over to the Cunningham's front lawn. However, when the cops arrived, both of them answered the door perfectly fine. Turns out they already knew about my spying, and were so annoyed by it, they decided to pull a prank on me. Great, my curious neighbors have also witnessed this whole humiliating ordeal. But the worst part was seeing the disappointment on Tim's face. You have to stop being so stubborn. Not every family is like yours. I couldn't say a word, not even when the cops gave me a warning. That night, I tossed and turned as Tim's words wiggled around my mind. Suddenly, something caught my attention. It's from Tim's house. Some flashlights were moving around. I tried calling Tim, but he didn't answer. Of course, he'd be in deep sleep by now. Calling the cops was useless because of that very recent embarrassing incident. That's it. I'm doing it myself. Out there on Tim's front lawn, my heart was beating like crazy. Thieves! Thieves! The startled thieves turned around, so I blared the air horn, then shouted. 
Freeze! Stay where you are! Hands over your heads! But, obviously, I, a teenager with one working leg, never actually expected any criminal to stand still. They quickly got a hold of me, and right when I thought my life was over... Get away from her! Tim, thank goodness! Other neighbors also came and stopped the thieves. Tim called the cops, and this time, they reported to the scene ASAP. Phew, that was insane. Mrs. Jones, Tim's mom, thanked me and invited me to stay the night. It's really nice of her, even though she burst out laughing when I explained the situation with the Cunninghams. When Tim went to grab some drinks for us, she asked me why I was alone in this condition. So, I spilled everything about my family. Contrary to her reaction just now, she showed me sympathy. From her experience, love didn't always have a happy ending, but it doesn't mean it's not real. Tim's dad and I had genuine feelings for each other. It's just that over time, things changed. We're open to accept this and be honest with each other. That's what real love is. I wouldn't change a thing and I would still fall crazily in love with him, despite knowing we would eventually break up. Because that's how I got Tim, the second real love of my life. Her words hit different. Maybe I'd given love a bad name. You're right, love is not at fault, and Tim is so lucky to have a loving mom like you. Meanwhile, my parents don't just hate each other, they put it all on me too. Bet you, even tonight's incident won't make them care. I see where you're coming from, but why don't you just give it a try? Their reactions might surprise you. So, I called them up, and guess what? They both sounded concerned on the phone and said they'd come home as soon as they could. See, I told you so. It's alright now. Timmy, please show Lex where she'll be sleeping. That was really brave of you. Being all heroic out there despite your whole situation. I wouldn't have risked my life if it wasn't for... If it wasn't for what? I'm all ears. For you. I'm sorry I overreacted. The thought of becoming a boring old couple who hate each other bugged me. But then I realized if we were together, we wouldn't have to be that. We could be like the Cunninghams. That doesn't sound too bad now, does it? I guess not. Next morning, I woke up to my parents' call. They actually kept their promise this time. My mom explained that she thought dad was home to take care of me, while dad absentmindedly assumed mom only left in a fit of anger and was going to return soon. So they really do care about me. They just have a terrible way of showing it. They stayed together, thinking it would be best for me. But the unending tension and bickering was eating us all up from the inside. This incident opened their eyes, so they agreed to have a peaceful divorce while still looking after me together. I'm finally free from the cast, but I actually feel even more liberated than before. Is this the power of my newfound belief in love? Is it because I've realized that love was around me all along? I'm not sure myself, but who cares? Alex and Timothy signing off. Finally, my spectacular sweet 16th is here. I spent months deliberating over every tiny detail of this perfect butterfly-themed party. Better yet, all the VIPs from the fashion industry were invited. Pretty impressive, huh? By the way, I'm Charlotte Stone, a fashion influencer with over 500,000 followers on Instagram. One day, I'm going to become an iconic designer just like Tori Burch. This party was my big chance to get noticed by all of these big shots. But wait, Ava? What on earth is she doing? Don't you realize how important it is to sort out garbage? It's not all junk. Like, this one is very valuable. Oh. My. Gosh. Ugh. And now she was replacing the guest's napkin with some biodegradable tissue. Suddenly, she startled and rushed to an incoming guest. Your scarf! Is that real mink fur? You ruthless monster! Oh no. That was Trixie Maxflower, the famous drag queen who's now strutting off in anger thanks to my sister's outburst. Ava was ruining everything with her hippie ways, and all of my guests were leaving. No, 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 it's all ruined, and it's all her fault. Ugh, this wasn't the first time Ava had pulled things like this. She called herself an eco-activist, and constantly brought rubbish home to remake into... things argued with anyone who didn't sort their waste properly, and forced everyone she knew to join climate change protests. The worst part was, I was always dragged into those dumb campaigns. It's super embarrassing being called the trash girl's little sis. Lonnie, where are you going? Wait up! Hey, trash girl, why don't you recycle this into skating shoes, huh? Next thing I knew, a gross banana peel landed smack bang in my face. 
Lottie, are you okay? No! My party was going perfectly until you barged in with your lunatic eco-anxiety. I wish you'd left my party, not them. Actually, I wish I didn't have a tree-hugging, trash-loving sister at all. Then I pushed Ava aside and stormed off. She'd gone too far this time. But maybe what I said was a bit much? The next morning, I woke up to see a birthday gift from Ava on my bedside table. It was this cute bracelet. Made from recycled plastic, of course. It made me smile and reminded me of all the time she'd taken care of me. I went to her room to thank her for her gift, but she wasn't there. Then I spotted a letter on her bed. Mom, Dad, Charlotte, I'm going away to live by my beliefs and values without affecting you all. Don't look for me. Oh no, don't tell me that it's all because of what I said yesterday. She knew I didn't mean it, right? I'm sure she'll calm down and come back soon. But then, one week passed, then a month, and now it's been almost two years and my sister still hasn't returned home. We've looked for her at environmental events, but still had no hint. Until, one day, I stumbled upon a YouTuber who talked about discovering an eco-friendly island run by a community of environmentalists. Hmm, that sounds like Ava's style. Wait a minute, I've seen this before. This island looked just like the one from the picture hanging in Ava's room. There it is! That must be the island's coordinates! I gotta go find my sister! Oh boy, that was a long ride. Now I just need to find a boat that will take me to the island. Let's check the map. Huh? These are my stuff! Right at that moment, a woman reached me. Hey, what are you doing with my bag? I quickly apologized and returned her bag, then rushed back to the train to find mine. But I was too late. No phone, no map. What to do now? I asked around, but no one had heard of this eco-island. Hopeless, I slumped onto a bench, when suddenly a man tapped my shoulder and told me that his boat was heading to that island. I followed him to the harbor, but when I saw the boat, I immediately changed my mind and turned to leave, but the man wouldn't let go of my hand. I tried my best to resist as his two scary-looking crewmates headed towards us. Oh no, this isn't going to end well. Let her go. Noah, is this a kidnapping? Should I call the cops? Panicked, the man let go of me, then grumbled and left. I trembled in shock, and it took ages for my heart rate to return to normal. I can't imagine what Ava had to go through out there all this time. Why are you trying so hard to get to the Eco Island? It doesn't seem like you're seen. Now that I'd calmed down and looked at this guy properly, ooh, he was cute, and he knew about the island? Turns out he's a former resident and was now taking his sister there. I asked him if he knew anyone named Ava Stone, but he shook his head, saying that most people who came to the island changed their names to start a new life. Okay, so I just have to see for myself if Ava was actually there. However, Noah said he couldn't help, because the island has strict rules concerning newcomers. So I had to lie that I was also an eco-activist to convince them to bring me along. And... Ha! It worked! My hunch told me that I was now one step closer to finding Ava. That evening, Noah set up a tent on the beach and we waited there for a boat that was scheduled to take us to the island in the morning. Seeing Noah take care of Ellie made me miss my sister so much. My selfish stupidity had driven her away, but now I'm going to put things right. I'll definitely find you, Ava. Next day, Noah woke me up so early that even the gulls weren't about. We got on this rickety-looking sailboat without any engine. Hello? Were we going to the island or back to the primeval times? Noah helped sailing the boat while I had to take care of the ropes. This was way harder than it looked. I could barely feel my arm muscles. Best wind ever. Charlotte, you're our lucky charm. <sighs> but yeah, at least I had this beautiful view to compensate. Suddenly, the rope slipped out of my hand causing the winch handle to spin and fling my bracelet into the sea. Oh no! Noah tried to stop me, but I was already deep in the water and immediately got swarmed by garbage. There it is! I pushed the trash aside, grabbed the bracelet, and was about to swing back when a fishnet caught my foot. Ah! I'm stuck! While struggling, I saw a dead sea turtle, tangled in plastic bags drifting by. Is it foreshadowing my own fate? Then... I felt a tug on my waist, and suddenly I was rising above the water. 
through coughs and splutters for air. I saw... Noah! He'd saved me again! How could you be so foolish? You're lucky I reached you in time. No, you're the lucky one who just got yourself a new girlfriend. Me? What's wrong with you? Your actions could have killed yourself and my brother, and all you can think about is flirting? I'm sorry, but that bracelet is really important to me. And I'm serious. What is your type of girl, Noah? M me? Oh, I... maybe someone... mature and brave? Got it. From now on, I'll be more mature then. By the next dawn, I could finally see our destination. But right when I stepped foot on the shore, two men who seemed to be village guards stopped me. You said you were bringing one sister, not two. Who is she? She's with me, Noah said. I tried my best to convince them, but they insisted on following the rule. No outsiders on the island. I didn't want any drama. All I wanted was to find my sister. Hey, the chief is coming! Jeez, what else is happening? I grabbed Noah's hand and hid behind his back. Please don't leave me alone. I won't. With my eyes closed, I heard someone step in and the female voice said, What's all this commotion about? Wait, that voice. I took a peek at the village chief. It's... Ava! Ava? Is it really you? Charlotte? I found my sister. I rushed to hug her as tight as I could. I've missed you so much. Oh, little Lottie, how did you get here? I've missed you too. I'm so sorry for what I said. I... It's okay. I've forgotten about it already. Come, let me show you around. Turns out, the day she left home, she gathered like-minded people to come to this island and save its ecosystem. They built this village and a dike to protect the island from rising sea levels. When Ava asked me about my journey here, I told her all about the struggles I had to go through and how Noah had saved me. You like Noah? I guess so, but what's wrong with that? I mean, you always hated my eco-lifestyle, but Noah and I... You do know we share the same mindset, right? That's true. They had many things in common, while I was, like, living in another world to them. It's okay. I've changed a lot since the last time you saw me, Ava. I was wondering if I could, um, stay here for a while? Ava... Agreed! Yay! Now I will have some more time to persuade my sister to go home and to win my man's heart. So, as the newest member of the village, the next day I started helping everyone with their tasks, like collecting coconuts, making DIY stuff, and planting corals. I even made use of my fashion sense and came up with stylish designs that were also environmentally friendly. Although Noah was too busy to see my creations, other villagers were very excited about them and often visited my workshop to try on new clothes. Hey, sunshine. These designs are top-notch. You're like a tailor goddess. Um, that's Sam, my co-worker at the workshop. He seems odd, but he's actually a genius who could create technological devices out of scrapped materials. Each day, he gave me a different kind of weird gift. This guy was definitely having a crush on me. But even his unicorn bicycle made from seashell couldn't move me, as I only had eyes for Noah. Speaking of Noah, he just walked past my workshop, right on time to show him this new material. I eagerly ran towards him, but stopped as Ava suddenly pulled him toward the hammock, leaned closer, and whispered something in his ear. What? So, when Noah said he preferred mature girls, he meant Ava? But what was my sister thinking? She knew I liked him. After that day, I couldn't concentrate on anything because of those two. Noah started to make excuses to not clean the coral reefs with me. And guess who was behind it all? Ava! Ouch. Great. I accidentally just stepped on the sea urchin. So I was rushed to the medical hut. Ava also came over to ask if I was okay, but I refused to talk to her. Or Noah. The wound swelled up, and I still couldn't walk normally a few days later. Surprisingly, Ellie started being nice and took care of me and even went spying on Noah and Ava for me. Those two are made for each other. I even saw them secretly kissing a few times. They're the perfect king and queen of this island. Now there is no doubt that they're dating behind my back. How could Ava do this to me? Feeling betrayed, I dragged myself to the workshop. Maybe work can distract me from all this mess in my head. But here I was, stuck with Sam and his cheesy pickup lines.
You must be exhausted, because you've been running through my mind all day. Ugh, just leave me alone. I stormed out of there, but tripped and fell over. Right then, a hand reached out to help me. It was Ava. Jeez, she's the last person I want to see right now. You don't have to pretend you care about me. You know full well that I like Noah, but you still got with him. Charlotte, what are you talking about? I'm leaving today, and so should everyone in this village. This place is for cowards who ignore the real eco-problems that are happening in the outside world. There, I let it all off my chest. But unexpectedly, the villagers came out of the bushes, holding decorations and a birthday cake with my name on it. They were throwing a surprise party for me. Oh no, I... I didn't mean to... Disheartened by my words, they all left. I guess you saw me with the chief when we were planning your birthday surprise. There is nothing going on between us. I thought you'd grown up, Charlotte. But I was wrong then. God, the guilt I felt right now was killing me. Frustrated and ashamed, I knew I couldn't stay here any longer. I waited until everyone was asleep to sneak to the beach and set sail on a small boat into the stormy night. But I couldn't make it far before a giant wave engulfed me and the boat. This is the end, I guess. But when I opened my eyes, Noah's face appeared in front of me. Did you just save me again? No, the chief did. But where is she? Noah didn't say anything, but just looked glumly out to sea. Wait, this is not happening. My sister can't be out there, right? No, no, no. How can I live knowing that my sister drowned because of me? Are you crying for your missing shoe? I turned around to see Ava, alive and well. Ava, thank God! I giddily jumped towards her. But, ouch, I forgot that my leg was still hurt. I'm so sorry for how stupid and selfish I was. Don't be foolish next time. Nothing's going on between me and Noah. He's all yours. I looked at Noah and we both turned to motto red. The next day, Ava gathered everyone around so I could publicly apologize to them. I was ready for the villagers to throw coconut shells at me, but instead they admitted that my words were partly true. This lifestyle needs to be promoted to the world, since everyone deserves to live in a clean and healthy environment that requires a joint effort. Then they all agreed that the perfect person to influence the young generation about this matter was me. Wow, I didn't expect that, but yes, I'm willing to carry out this meaningful mission. And Noah volunteered to leave the island and go inspire the outside world with me. Only then, Ellie apologized to me and confessed she'd made up the stories about Ava and Noah just to make me give up on flirting with her brother. I thought you'd only cause him trouble, but now I know he likes you a lot. So promise that you'll make life easy for him? I'll try my best, kid. Promise. It's been five years since we left the island, and I fulfilled my dream of becoming a famous fashion designer. But most importantly, I was able to make fashion eco-friendly. Pretty cool, right? When the fashion show ended, I went on stage and the crowd went wild with applause. My creative inspiration comes from my dear sister Ava, who's shown me how vital a clean environment is to each and every one of us. I also want to thank Noah, my incredible boyfriend, for his unconditional love and support. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. As I finished the speech, Noah came on stage with this huge bouquet, while Ava and the villagers showered me with hugs and praise. I guess one trip to an eco-island could change your entire life, right? This was like a dream come true. That gorgeous man in front of me is Ethan. My crush since I was just 14. Back then, Ethan was my dad's business partner. So he'd often come over to our house for dinner. For years, I adored him in secret. But now, at 19, I could finally be honest about my feelings. So when I ran into him by chance in the grocery store, I felt like it was meant to be. He invited me for a drink in the cafe nearby, and we instantly hit it off. We started dating. And now, we're an official couple. There's just one thing that worries me. Ethan is recently divorced and has a 10-year-old daughter, Clarice, who he has full-time. While daydreaming, I couldn't hide away from the thought of being someone's stepmom. Oh my, I didn't want to become a mom yet. Don't worry, 
Clarice is a cute kid. I just know you two will get along. Clarice gave me a devious smile the moment she saw me. Another fish got hooked. Huh? Hey, that's not the right manner. Apologize, now! Ethan immediately said. Clarice let out a loud, Ugh! Then reluctantly apologized. Great! When has it ever been easy to be friends with a naughty ten-year-old girl? I understand this better than most, as I have a little sister. She's either giving me a headache or crazing at me for candy, and I could tell that Clarice was going to be no different. <sighs> One day, Ethan called me in a panic, saying he had an urgent business trip. They informed me at the very last minute. I didn't have time to find a babysitter. Can you help me take care of Clarice for a few days? What? I've only just met the girl, and now I have to mind her for a few days? I still didn't know what to say when Ethan continued. I'll make it up to you after this. And then, the next thing I knew, Clarice was at my front door. Oh gosh, somebody help me! Well, you know those girls that age, like my little sister? I kept pouring out while Mike just smiled and slightly shook his head. I have to make her like me to win over Ethan. So, lovely Mike, can you please come hang out with us? Seriously? Please? Aren't you good with the ladies? Fine. You know I can't say no to you. I took Clarice to a theme park. She frowned the moment she saw Mike. Um, who's this? I don't like strangers. I smiled and said, This is Mike. He's really cool and I don't care. Cindy? What kind of situation did you drag me into? Man, I had to ask myself that question. This wasn't what I envisioned it to be. The outing turned into a competition between them. Clarice challenged Mike to play game after game with her until she won. In the end, they played with the water guns, and I knew for sure Mike let her win. But as soon as he let go of his water gun, Clarice squirted water all over him, leaving him completely drenched. Oops. What on earth is this? That's the price for the loser. <laughs> Okay, Cindy, that's enough. Have fun! And he stormed off. Oh no! What have I done to him? I stood there dumbfounded, staring at Clarice. Okay, so it was kind of funny, but I couldn't laugh at my poor friend. I want ice cream! Clarice grinned, then skipped away. Hmm, ice cream. A girl after my own heart. On the way home, we talked so much about her fave show, The Babysitter's Club, and how Stacy is her favorite character. Hmm, maybe the day wasn't so bad after all. A few days later, Ethan returned, and I was really excited to see him. Thank you so much for taking care of Clarice. Meanwhile, I noticed Clarice was slowly backing out, with an awkward look on her face. I thought she'd be as happy as me to see him, but it didn't seem that way. Darling, are you okay? Are you sick? I... I'm okay. I need to go to my room. After that, at dinner, the question, are you sick, was raised no less than ten times, and it made me feel sick too. I said I'm not sick, and I don't want to see a doctor. Ethan, I think Clarice is fine, so maybe stop asking her. Hearing that... Ethan seemed uncomfortable and turned away. Weird. What was wrong with them? Maybe this was just something they did. Hmm. Whatever it is, I wasn't enjoying this heavy atmosphere. The next day after lunch, Clarice was helping me clean the table while Ethan was packing to go on his next trip. She insisted on washing the dishes while I said goodbye to Ethan. We were hugging in the doorway when suddenly... I heard a loud scream coming from the kitchen. Ethan and I both rushed in there and saw Clarice crying as she gripped her hand. Ethan frantically asked, What happened? While I quickly searched for a first aid kit. I was washing the dishes, but I accidentally cut my hand. Cindy, I'm sorry. I wasn't being careful. Please don't punish me. What? What was she talking about? Ethan seemed to have the same question as me. Cindy always makes me do the chores. She told me if I do them badly, I can't have dinner. 
Huh? Why was she saying things that weren't true? Turning pale with shock, I muttered out, No, that's not true. I I don't want to stay here. Dad, let me go home. Clarice interrupted me as she was crying harder. I'm so sorry, but I have to go now. I don't even know if you're lying or not. How can you say that to me? Clarice shouted. You monster! Then she ran upstairs. I stood there not knowing what to do. My brain couldn't process what just happened. Ethan looked at me and sighed. Why didn't he say anything? He didn't honestly think I was capable of doing that. Did he? I decided I needed to confront Clarice about this. So I went up to her room and calmly said, Clarice, why did you say that? You forced me to do all the chores. What? How can you lie like that? I never do such a thing. Oh, but are people going to believe you or a poor little girl? Oh, my God. There was me, thinking she was a sweet kid, when in actual fact, she was the complete opposite. I rushed outside and, shaking, I pulled my phone out. I called Mike and told him everything. Oh boy, that kid is complicated. Maybe she doesn't want you to be with her dad. But even so, what she did was weird. I think you should stay away from them. But how to? I couldn't just run away. Besides, Ethan was on his trip. Again, and I was in charge of her. So I kept my distance. No more talking or having fun. But it seemed that Clarice had other ideas. I was watching TV in the living room when Clarice appeared and pulled my shirt. Cindy, I want you to play video games with me. The more silent I was, the harder she pulled. No, Clarice, I'm not in the mood. I shouted, go play by yourself. Then I walked off. A few minutes later, Cass, a senior student, came over to give me some documents. We sat down and had some iced tea. Then suddenly, bam, and a cry. Oh no. Cass and I rushed to the noise. Clarice had fallen down the stairs in the basement and was surrounded by the laundry basket and dirty clothes. Cass quickly ran down there and helped her up. Are you okay? What happened? Cindy told me to do the laundry in time. The basket was so full, so I slipped. No, no, no! I screamed inside my head when Cass gave me a concerned look. Cass, please, I'll explain later. Can you please leave? Why? I screamed at Clarice's face the moment Cass left. If you don't play with me, you'll be a child abuser. You'll have to go to jail. Ugh, this is driving me crazy. Just a few days ago, she wanted her dad to take her away from here, and now she's blackmailing me for not playing with her? Right at that moment, Ethan called. Hi, Cindy. I just want to check on you two. Is Clarice sick or anything? Ugh, what on earth is this? Am I crazy? Or are these two actually weird? OMG. I need Mike. Now. Please, take me away from here, I said as I opened the door for Mike. Stop! Clarice shouted. You two can't go anywhere! Oh, now you're telling me what not to do? If you go, I'll tell the whole world how badly you've been treating me. You'll both go to jail. So that's your scam? Her smirk disappeared. She turned pale and stuttered. N no, it, it was my dad's. Your dad's scam? Clarice looked flustered as she realized what she had just blurted out. Then she quickly covered it up. Nothing! Mike sat down and looked at her with stern eyes. I stood there, waiting for the answer. I... Um... My daddy made me! Eventually, Clarice confessed. Turns out, Ethan was a professional scammer who scams young, wealthy girls into giving him money. Worse, he dragged his daughter into his scheme. The plan went like this. He used his handsome looks to flirt with the girls, then Clarice's cuteness to get the girls' empathy. After that, he would go on some last-minute business trip and ask them to take care of Clarice. 
Meanwhile, Clarice would pretend to be seriously sick. When Ethan arrived back, he would persuade the girls to hand over money for hospital fees, then he and Clarice would disappear out of their lives. At first he told me to do what he said and he'd get me a bike! What about the abusing lie you made up? I asked, still shocked. I made up that excuse so Dad would take me away. I really like you, so I don't want his plan to work. Then why did you continue to act up? Because Cindy was mad at me, and I wanted her to play with me, so I pulled that trick again. Tears streamed down my face. Unbelievable! I voluntarily stepped into his trap right at the beginning. He didn't even have to do much. I felt like such an idiot. After that, we exposed Ethan. Clarice helped us, too. Turns out, he's bankrupt, which is why his wife left him and why he's no longer my dad's business partner. Ethan was arrested, but Clarice's mom was out of the country, and she refused to return for her daughter. To be honest, I love Clarice, and I didn't want her to live in the orphanage. So I let her live at my place for a while before I told my parents everything. Obviously, my parents have more capacity and power to deal with this. It took a while for Clarice to get over her guilt and settle in, but now we get on better than ever. She's a sweet, cute girl who deserves far better than her parents have given her. Then one day, I came back home from college to find Clarice placing some roses on the dining table, which was already romantically set up with candles and steak. Cindy, you're back! How can you prepare a full dinner like this? Clarice didn't say anything. She just giggled and ran to her room. Someone hugged me from behind. Would you mind being my date tonight? It was Mike. Thinking about it, I guess my perfect man was right under my nose this entire time. So, grinning, I turned around and replied, I thought you'd never ask. Hey, Kat here again. Are you ready for the next part of my story? If you haven't seen the first two parts, then what are you doing? Go and watch them right now. But if you have seen them, do you remember what happened to me? I'm a tomboy, a fact which my mom hates. Then her fiancé Max moved in with his girly daughter Taylor, and mom clearly favored her over me. If this wasn't enough to deal with, I was then in an embarrassing situation at the mall while trying to be girly to impress this cute guy called Garrett who's into girly girls. So after the rescue of my best friend Harry and some help getting ready from my mom, I arranged to meet Garrett at the coffee shop so I could tell him exactly how I felt about him before his soccer team party. As I walked up the street to meet Garrett, I felt so happy. I'm sure it would be a surprise for him to see me dressed all girly, and he'd be into it. Then we'd kiss. Wow. That sounds great. I was the first one there, so I grabbed a hot chocolate and waited. Jeez, that five-minute wait felt like five years. Then he strolled through the door looking so casual but cute. He looked me up and down and then said, Um, Kat, you do know the party later is just a casual hangout? I kept my cool as I replied, Oh, this old dress? It's just something I threw on in a hurry. He ordered a drink and we talked for a bit. I knew it was the only chance, either now or never, so I just came out with it. Look, Garrett, I think you're cool. Really cool, in fact. I have a crush on you. No, I think I like you a lot. He looked a little flustered, but surely this was totally normal, as he was just digesting my words, right? After a few minutes of silence, he gave me an awkward look as he said, Cat. I think you're great, but you're not my type. I just see you as one of the boys. I'm not his type? And he just sees me as a boy? I sat there completely heartbroken. Each word he said felt like a sharp knife stabbing into my little heart. I immediately stood up and asked him, What, you don't think I'm a girl? I'm in a dress for goodness sake. If I'm not girly enough for you, then who is? He seemed a bit confused by my question, then reluctantly replied, Um, I'm into gentle girls. Who need me to protect? Um, like Taylor, for example. She's your sister, right? 
Could you help me and Taylor become a couple? What? Not only did he have the cheek to publicly reject me, but now he was admitting to me that he liked that Barbie doll? I yelled at him. You have to be kidding me. Out of all the girls in the world, you like Taylor? Then I stormed out of there, relieved that I'd worn ballet pumps over evil high heels. I arrived home to the smell of freshly baked scones. Then I saw my mom and Taylor baking together in the kitchen. I wasn't in the mood for cooking with Barbie hour, so I slammed the door shut and stomped up to my room. My mom appeared and shouted up the stairs to me, Hey, honey, how was your date? Why are you back so early? Seriously, it was pretty clear from my door slamming that it hadn't gone well. Why did she feel the need to humiliate me in front of Taylor, of all people? Get real, mom. I'm clearly upset. But then, what do you know? You only care about your shiny new daughter, Taylor. I ran into my room to change out of that damn dress I was wearing. Then I threw it down the stairs at her and yelled out, It's your dress, so take it back, and play dress-ups with her instead. My mom looked hurt, and at first, I felt a little bad. But then she shouted back, Why can't you just act like a normal girl and grow up? If you stopped being so selfish and made an effort with your appearance, your date might have gone better. Then Taylor continued, Don't be too much for mom. She means well. If that boy doesn't like you, then that's your issue, not hers. What the hell? How dare this nobody blame me? And why was she calling my mom, mom? I didn't call Max dad. Ugh, she was the worst person in the world. I hated her. I wanted her to go back to Barbie land and never come back. I stormed out of the house and took the bus to my dad's house. I tried to hold back my emotions so that I wouldn't burst into tears, but honestly, I had nothing. Garrett had brutally rejected me in favor of Taylor. I was still in a mood with Harry, and Mum had made it clear I was an embarrassment to her. The worst part was Harry had been right. I had lost myself. I was not myself anymore. I showed up at Dad's, and as soon as he opened the door, I burst into tears and hugged him. I told him everything and begged him to let me live with him. Dad tried to analyze everything for me. After a while, I calmed down and realized that, okay, maybe I was a bit sassy with mom. Then Dad said, actually, Kat, there's something I wanted to tell you. I really still love your mom and want you to help me get back with her. Whoa, I wasn't expecting that, but I was totally down for helping him. Goodbye to Barbie Taylor and hello to a proper family. Dad allowed me to stay for the night to let the tension between mom and me calm down. His apartment was on the small side, so I had to sleep on the couch. But I didn't mind, as it meant I could stay up watching movies all night without mom moaning at me that I needed my beauty sleep. I arrived home the next day to mom and Max cleaning the house together. They were laughing and joking around and, yeah, okay, they looked really happy together but Dad deserved this happiness more, right? I greeted both of them, but only Max replied. My mother ignored me like I was invisible. She must have still been mad at me. So all this tension wasn't a part of my get Dad back with Mom plan. So before I left for school, I walked up to Mom, said sorry, then kissed her on the cheek. Cheesy, but worth it. Then, as I was rummaging through my locker at school, I felt someone pat me on the shoulder. I turned around to see that it was Harry. Cat, I'm sorry, he said. I turned around and continued to look through my locker. I'd forgiven him already, but I wanted to make him sweat a bit first. Come on, Cat. I won't be able to study if I know you're mad at me, and my grades will suffer. I laughed and said, take me out for ice cream after school, and I may consider forgiving you. I think I can manage that. He smiled at me. After school, we went to the ice cream shop nearby. My mood was so good, and I told Harry all about my plan to get Dad back with Mom. He wasn't so sure about it, but regardless of this, he promised to have my back. So, I had an ally, and the plan to heal my parents' feelings officially began. First, I invited Dad over for dinner. Mom wasn't overly impressed, but she couldn't say no. After all, he was my dad. During the meal, I went on about past stories, such as the time we all went on vacation together for my seventh birthday, and Dad lost his swimming trunks in the sea. My parents and Max just laughed, but 
I could make out the annoyed look on Taylor's face. After the meal, we watched TV together, and Taylor volunteered to make drinks for everyone. Then she brought out five glasses of orange juice. Dad took a large sip of his, then immediately spit it out all over his clothes and rushed to the toilet. Turns out, she'd put mustard in my dad's glass, but neither Max nor Mom said anything about it. Damn little Taylor. Then one night, when I knew that Mom and Max were going on a private date, I deliberately hid Max's key. By the time they found them in the plant pot two hours later, they'd missed their time slot. Talk about success. Another day, my mom suggested going on a picnic, so I immediately called Harry and my dad and invited them to join. Then, while we were in the park waiting for Harry to show up, I saw Garrett walking over, hand in hand, with Taylor. Talk about awkward. Garrett couldn't even meet my eye, and I just wanted the ground to swallow me up. Mom asked them how long they'd been together. She said two weeks, so I did the math. O-M-G. That meant they got together on the day I confessed my feelings towards him. Whatever. I was so over Garrett. Although I have to admit, I was relieved when I saw Harry walking over with a basket full of my favorite foods. Taylor kept asking Garrett to feed her. Ew. It was so awkward. When Harry saw me staring at the couple with bullet-like eyes, he so quickly passed me a slice of chocolate cake. A while later, I asked Harry to help me take some photos. Then I quickly dragged Dad and Mom to take family pictures. I could see Dad was enjoying standing next to her, and I heard him tell her that she looked beautiful. Good one, Dad. Only Taylor wasn't having any of it. She immediately led Max over and pushed me out of the way so he could stand next to Mom. I stood next to Taylor, and before Harry counted to three, I flipped Taylor's hair and deliberately stood over her. She glared at me. But I'm on top of the world, sucker. Anyway, I felt so good after that picnic, and I even thought that the day when Dad returned home would be soon. But a few days later during dinner, Mom and Max went on about what starters they wanted at their wedding. What? She still wanted to marry Max? So what about my dad? I immediately showed my annoyance, skipped my half-eaten meal, and stormed up to my room. I sat in my room, looked back at the picnic photos, and thought about my next plan. Then, I heard a knock on the door. It was Max. Cat, I have something important to tell you, he said with a sad voice. Uh Uh-oh, this couldn't be good. Could it?